Ah. What about the aperiodic sequence? Okay, so this is the non-periodic guy. He's the same one that came from that beta that we looked at. So I could start copying and looking how many different ways there are to fill in a window of size 1 here. Is there going to be any window? In the periodic guy, there were at most 8 ways to fill in the window of size 8, right? Is there any number such that there's at most that number of ways to fill it in? Well, if I take the window of size 1, there's at least two ways to fill it in. Well, there's exactly two. There's only zeros and ones. How about a window of size 2? Would this one work? Well, 0, 0 is possible. 0, 1 is possible. 1, 0 is possible. Turns out 1, 1 is also there, but I don't care. That's three ways to fill in the window of size 2. More ways than the number of window, the, the size of my window. How about 3? 0, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0. 1, 0, 1. 0, 1, 1, four ways to fill in the window of size 3, okay? Window size 4, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. There are five ways to fill in the window of size 4. So is this a general phenomenon? Is this a general thing that happens with these sequences? If I started off with a guy that's not periodic, am I always going to get, with any size window you ask for, more ways to fill it in? And it turns out the answer is yes, and this is a theorem from the 1940s that is proved by Morrison Headland. Take a sequence of zeros and ones. It's periodic if and only if there's some n, that's the size of my window, such that when I fill in the window of size n, there are at most n ways to do it, less than or equal to n ways to do it. So the periodic sequence that we saw, the window size was 8. There were eight ways to fill in any window of size 8. The non-periodic, by this theorem, there is no window. You look at a window of size 100, there'll be at least 101 ways to fill it in. You look at a window of size 1,000, there's at least 1,001 ways to fill it in. Okay? So this is, um, this theorem was proved in the 1940s, but it actually has, there's some research, uh, in fact, the colloquium that I'll be giving tomorrow, will be about things related to this, but I'll give you a hint of what's going on there um, right now into other questions that are related to this. So, so far every result I've told you about is results from, you know, well, this is the latest 1940s, but there are much more modern results on this because you could ask, for example, what happens if I go to two dimensions? Okay? Pretend that this is, again, by infinite goes in all directions. It's a sequence of zeros and ones. I've filled in everything. And what I could do is ask, OK, same kind of question. Is there a window such that the number of ways to fill this in is at most that number, the size of that window? Well, if the window of size 1, you could fill it in with a 0 or the 1. Otherwise, it's not a very interesting pattern, right? So, so there's two ways to fill in the window of size 1. The window of size 2, I actually have choices already. Do I mean a window of size 2 like this, a horizontal, or a vertical window of size 2? So let's look first at the horizontal. 1, 0, fills it in. 0, 0, and there's at least another one here, 0, 1. There are three ways to fill in this window of size 2. If I look at the vertical window of size 2, well, I can fill that in with 0, 0, 0, 1. 1, 0, again, at least three ways to fill in this window of size 2. And I continue with the window of size 4. 1, 0, 0, 0 fills it in. Moving around, you get 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0, 0. And 0, 0, 1, 0. And here's another one, 1, 0, 0, 1. So there's at least five ways to fill in the 2 by 2 window. And it turns out that this uh, this guy has no periodic direction. So what is a periodic direction? It would mean that I could move in that direction and constantly see the same pattern that I saw. It might be a vertical direction. I might be able to move this way and always see, I guess vertical is this way. I might be able to move this way and always see the same pattern up and up copying it. I might be horizontal or it could be some diagonal direction. It doesn't have to be vertical or horizontal. But this one it turns out in the pattern that I drew here, and you have to imagine it extended in all directions, it has no periodic direction. 
anywhere. So you could ask, well, what about another one? In this pattern, for example, in this one, I hope you see that there are some patterns that repeat all over this guy. Turns out in this one, well, if I look at the window again of size 1, there better be both zeros and 1s, otherwise it's just not interesting to look at. If I look at the window of size 2, this time the horizontal window of size 2, there are three ways at least to fill it in. There could be more, but I don't really care about that. The vertical window of size 2 again, there's at least three ways to fill that in. And in this one, it turns out the way I've drawn it in the window of size 4, there are only four ways to fill it in. Okay, so now you might ask, does this mean that something different is going to happen? Well, it turns out, yes, in this case, there is a periodic direction here. And if I take this whole um, horizontal strip that I've uh, highlighted and you copy up, you get the same thing. In other words, vertical is a periodic direction. Okay, and again, imagine that this goes by infinite all directions. Okay, so you keep copying up, you see the same thing. And that's a periodic direction. I could highlight just one of the columns and you can see inside that column there's a period, a thing piece that I can copy up. This one is one zero moving up and it goes, keeps going on. But if I looked at a different column, it might be a different pattern that I need. And the sec the column one over is zero, zero, zero that goes. But it's the same direction that works. The, horror, the vertical direction is always a periodic direction. So this is a general question that you could ask. I told you this theorem of morrison headland it's an if and only if that you get periodicity. If and only if there's a window of the right size where you see at most, some window where you see at most that number of patterns, ways to fill it in. Well, does the same thing happen in two dimensions? Is there periodicity, here a direction of periodicity, if and only if there's a window that when you fill it in, you have at most that size of the window? Okay, well, that's a conjecture, it's open. Okay, so conjecture just means that we don't know how to prove it, but uh, Maurice Nivat made this conjecture, believes it's true. Um, it says the following, if there exists an n and a k, so they think about this as an n by k window, some rectangle that has n on one side, k on the other side. If there's an n and k by k window that such that it sees at most n times k patterns in it, then there is a direction of periodicity. Okay, there is some direction that you can go in to see periodicity. That's an open conjecture. There are some results, and I will tell you about, uh, all about the results in, in my colloquium uh, tomorrow. But um, for patterns which are at most rectangles of height 2, like the one I had in the previous picture, so height 2, they were 2 by 2, they were both width and height 2, this has been proven. So there is the theorem. But for general n and k, if there exist n and k, this is still an open <laughs> question. So what I hope this, this makes you believe a little bit is that there may be hidden patterns in things that you just don't know that they're there yet. You can't really see them yet. There might be hidden patterns, whether it be in these bi-infinite grids, in single lines, uh, in rotations of the circle, um, in, in the kinds of patterns that when I was coloring the Schur's theorem and other coloring things like that, there may be hidden patterns even if you don't know that they're there. So it's very difficult to create something that's going to be completely disordered. And there are many conjectures that are like this in math and there's a famous one of Erdos. It's worth $5,000. Erdos liked to put prizes and 5000 I think was the most he ever put on a prize. And what this says is the following, if you have a subset of the integers, back to the integers, that satisfies this very simple property that the sum of the reciprocals diverges. So what that means is that if I add up the sum of the reciprocals, so 1 over a for each a inside this set of integers, it gets bigger than whatever you want. Okay, you, you wait till it gets bigger than 100, you, there's some bunch of uh, numbers in the set A, so that if you sum the reciprocals, it'll get bigger than 100 or 1,000 or a million or whatever you want. So if that keeps growing, then A has to contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Okay? That's a, the meaning that this set A has all sorts of hidden patterns. Remember arithmetic progressions, which I told you about at the beginning. They look like A, 
A plus B, A plus 2B, and so on. And what this says is that in some sense, if the set A is big, okay, having its sum of reciprocals diverge, be infinite, means that the set A can't be too tiny, then you have these patterns that are hidden inside the set. You might not have known that they were there, but the patterns are there. So an example of a set to which some of the reciprocals diverge is other than all the integers, which that one um, uh, is, is not so hard to show, but the primes have this property, okay, that the sum of the reciprocals diverge. And the fact that the primes contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions was proven around 2005 or so by Ben Green and Terry Tao. It's a very recent result. And uh, it's, but it's still far from proving this conjecture, which says that any set which satisfies this divergence condition actually has these hidden patterns. So um, the question that I hope I've left you to think with is, is it possible to create big enough in some sense sets of integers or s patterns somewhere, as long as they're big in some notion, that don't create any patterns. And I hope I've convinced you that if big enough is defined in some nice way, then they always have to have patterns in them. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, uh, with, uh, with Sheriff's theorem. So if I understood you correctly, you were saying that uh, if there are, and if, you know, you take a set of integers and a finite amount of color, and then color each one of those integers at, the, at random, there's going to be, there exists some type of pattern that's going to emerge, right? That's right. So what I'm thinking is if I take an uh, infinite amount of spaces and number them uh, consecutively from, from zero up to infinity, and then I fill those spaces with 10 symbols, let's call those symbols the numbers zero through nine, then I can create a, then I can just create at random some random number. Okay. You, know, you can put a decimal somewhere in there, you know, whatever, right? So what you're saying then is that every real number then has a pattern? Real numbers have lots of patterns in them. That's right. So what this is saying is exactly if you look at decimal expansions, you could use Schur's lemma, Schur's theorem, to say that there have to be times when you're going to see the same guy, some number between 0 and 9, repeating at the, this entry, this entry, and the sum of those entries. Any real number has to have that. And in fact, much more is true. There are many more generalizations of Schur's theorem that there have to be arithmetic progressions. So you could color the integers, or if you want, look at the decimals. That's another way to look at it. You could color the integers however you want, finitely many colors again, so using like your 10 colors that you use. It turns out that one of those colors has to contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Okay? That's a theorem of van der Verden. But, was, they're, but they're not going to be repeated. They're, they're going to be, they're arbitrarily they're long. They're not infinite progr arithmetic progressions. That's a very good point. It, they're finite patterns, there, but they're arbitrarily long. So somewhere in there, you will find digits in your decimal expansion that are some distance apart, but the same exact integer uh, digit repeats that same distance apart. Okay. 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 But for maybe for a hundred times or a thousand times, but it doesn't say it'll repeat that distance so infinite. So anyone look at the decimal expansion of pi and saw anything like that? It's in the, uh, what this says is it's in the decimal expansion of pi and there's lots of patterns in there. Okay. Right? Lots of them. Okay. Any other questions? I have a naive question about the Niemann connection. Uh, Niemann. Yep. Uh, has many computer scientists tried to hash out whether there is, you said, it's not being tested. Well, so, so Nivat was a com is a computer scientist. Uh, so this, this conjecture I came. Know. I mean, are people now, uh, they've tried it many times, and it didn't work? Is that I, I don't know a lot of co experimentation on it. Um, no, but the, the conjecture comes from computer science. I mean, that's exactly correct. It, it's, it's a natural uh, conjecture from there because it has to do with um, data storage and, and bits of zeros and ones. Um, I will tell you more about the results about it if you come tomorrow, but <laughs> uh, I don't want to spoil, spoil all of that. <laughs>
I have two questions. Uh, first, back to Schur's theorem. So I'm interested in the convergence in the sense that imagine I had some distribution over my colors, and now I, I sample independently on, on my sequence. Uh, as a function of the number of samples, Okay, so, so um, there's a lot of work that has gone into studying how far do you have to go, how many integers do I have to color to guarantee that I already see a pattern, A plus B equals C, or whatever other pattern you're looking for, which is not quite what you're asking, but it's fairly, it, it's related. So there is, in other words, if I use, let's say, two colors or K colors, it turns out that Schur's theorem is equivalent to the following statement. There exists an n, which depends on the number of colors and nothing else, such that if I only color the first n integers, I will already see one of those patterns. Okay, so that would answer your sort of sampling question. But computing what that n is and how it depends on k, there are upper bounds and there are lower bounds for it, and n of k, the, the number of colors, uh, is, is bounded by this, and it's greater than or equal to that. Those bounds are very far apart. Okay. Those bounds are quite far apart. Uh, so what, where the real answer is, is somewhere in between. Um, there, it's very well studied for van der Verden, this theorem about arithmetic progressions uh, that I just stated, um, where there it depends on two things. So van, this, this theorem is equivalent to saying that there exists an n, which depends on the length of the progression you're looking for and the number of colors you're using, such that if I color the first n integers, I see an arithmetic progression of that length in one of the colors. And those are the van der Verden numbers, depending on these two quantities, and they've been quite well studied. Um, it has to do with, it's, it's a very hard problem, extremely hard problem. Uh, sorry, my second question then. So you, you gave some examples of patterns, but is there a precise mathematical definition of what a pattern is? Can you say a pattern is self, a relation that satisfies some properties? No, so it really depends on the context. Pattern is whatever, and so that was why I said in my list of patterns, you know, you're welcome to think of whatever.